Number 1. Sarah was last seen after exiting her school bus at the end of the driveway of her family's residence on April 3, 1996, in rural Spooner, Wisconsin. She was about 100 yards from her house. There was a dark-colored pickup truck driving behind the bus, and when she got out it pulled up next to her, and she spoke to the driver, then got inside the vehicle. The truck backed out of Sarah's driveway and started off in the direction of the nearby town of Trago. Sarah has never been heard from again. Authorities initially classified Sarah as a runaway, but now they are unsure what caused her disappearance. She didn't take any clothing or money with her, and she wasn't behaving in an unusual manner before her disappearance. She had recently broken up with her 21-year-old boyfriend because her parents had forbidden her to see him. Sarah and her ex-boyfriend did have lunch together on the day of her disappearance, and he drove her back to school for her afternoon classes. He said this was the last time he saw her. Sarah's family believes she was harmed by someone she knew, as they don't think she would have gotten into a stranger's vehicle. There's speculation that Crystal Sulier's death may be connected to Sarah's disappearance. Sulier, who was 18 years old, disappeared from Cable, Wisconsin in October 1996. Five months later her body was found in Rock County, Wisconsin, but it wasn't identified until 2002. Her murder remains unsolved. Sulier and Sarah were both blonde young women in the same age group. They knew each other, and they also had at least 19 mutual friends, all of them young men in their 20s. Both Sulier and Sarah attended parties held by these men, and Sarah's school friends were unaware of this. None of the men have been named as suspects in Sarah's disappearance or Sulier's murder, which is also unsolved. Sarah's parents divorced when she was a toddler. She lived with her mother and stepfather at the time of her disappearance, but she visited her father and stepmother's home in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin on a regular basis, and she was thinking of moving in with them. Sarah was a sophomore at Spooner High School in 1996. Her father believes she is deceased. Number 2 Sierra left her home in the vicinity of Santa Teresa Avenue and Doherty Avenue in Morgan Hill, California at 6 a.m. on March 16, 2012. She was going to walk to the bus stop to catch a 735 bus to Ann Sobrato High School, where she was a sophomore and a cheerleader. Sierra texted a friend at 711 and agreed to meet her before class started. She never boarded her bus, never arrived at school and never met her friend. Her mother found out she was missing that evening when the school contacted her to say saying Sierra had missed class. She has never been heard from again. On March 17, Sierra's cellular phone was found on the roadside about three quarters of a mile from her home, it appeared to have been tossed from a passing vehicle. A day after that, the police found her bag in a cactus field on the roadside about two miles from the bus stop and one mile from where her phone was found. The bag had Sierra's pants and t-shirt folded and placed inside it. In May, two months after Sierra was last seen, authorities arrested Antolin Garcia Torres for her kidnapping and murder. Investigators stated they had both circumstantial and direct evidence against the suspect, including DNA evidence from his car, which police had seized in early April, and from Sierra's bag. Photos of Garcia Torres and his vehicle, a red and black Volkswagen Jetta, are posted with this case summary. Police found strands of Sierra's DNA inside his car, a strand of her hair on some rope in the trunk, and DNA from Garcia Torres on her discarded clothing. He has a prior criminal record, but not for any sex assaults or felonies. Police believe Sierra's presumed murder was a random act of violence, although she and Garcia Torres live just seven miles apart, there's no evidence the two ever met prior to her disappearance. At Garcia Torres's trial in May 2017, his defense argued Sierra was an unhappy teenager who had simply run away from home. He was convicted of her murder and also of three counts of attempted kidnapping. He had tried to abduct three other women from Safeway store parking lots in 2009, something the prosecution called training for Sierra's death. Garcia Torres was sentenced to life in prison, he could have faced the death penalty. Sierra was born and raised in Fremont, California, and previously attended high school there. Her parents divorced before her disappearance, and she lived with her mother and her mother's boyfriend. They had moved to Morgan Hill only about six months before Sierra disappeared. She has no history of running away. Foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved. Number 3 Travell was last seen in Columbus, Ohio on July 2, 1999. He was walking to the residence of a 19-year-old friend, Dallin Green, at the time. Green resided in the 1200 block of Republic Avenue. Travell has never been heard from again. 
His grandmother reported him as a missing person on July 3. After Travell's disappearance, investigators searched Green's home and found ample evidence of a homicide, including bloodstains, spent bullets, shell casings, handguns, clothing, and Travell's personal identification. A piece had been cut out of the living room carpet. Police documents indicate that Green was a member of a gang, the Bloodstone Villains, which Travell was interested in joining. Travell may have been subjected to a severe beating as a rite of initiation into the gang. Green has a criminal record, mostly for violent offenses. On June 28, several days prior to his disappearance, Travell's grandmother told police her grandson had been shot in the hand by an unknown assailant while walking near his home and went to Green's house for assistance afterwards. Green drove Travell and his grandmother to the hospital and stayed close by while Travell's injury was treated and placed in a cast. Sometime afterward, Travell allegedly admitted to his grandmother that he had not been attacked and had in fact shot himself at Green's home. It is unknown whether the shooting incident has anything to do with Travell's later disappearance. Authorities believe Travell is deceased and Green is the prime suspect in his death, but he has not been charged with anything related to it. Travell resided in the 1300 block of Republic Avenue in Columbus at the time of his disappearance, his grandmother had raised him and his younger brother since infancy. He was a student at Medina Middle School and enjoyed books and sports at the time he went missing. Travell's younger brother, Tywin Lamont Saunders, was shot to death in October 2009, at the age of 22. Lashanel Hargrove was indicted for the murder almost a year later, in August 2010. In 2011, he pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and admitted he'd shot Saunders during an argument. He was sentenced to 13 years in prison. In Saunders' obituary, it was noted that Travell predeceased him. They have one surviving brother, two stepbrothers and two stepsisters, as well as their grandmother, who raised them both from childhood. Travell's remains have not been recovered and his case remains unsolved. Number 4. Jacqueline's father, Jorge Vasquez, drove her and her mother, Olivia Castaneda, to a swap meet in Avondale, Arizona on May 6, 2001. The meet was near 123rd Avenue and Buckeye Road. Jacqueline was sitting in a white infant carrier with a green and white striped cushion. Castaneda left the baby in her carrier outside of a portable toilet while she assisted her two-year-old daughter inside the facility. Jacqueline had disappeared by the time her mother exited the stall. She has never been seen again. Authorities arrived quickly on the scene after the baby's abduction was reported and sealed off the swap meet. An extensive search of the area produced no evidence as to Jacqueline's whereabouts, however. Authorities ruled out her parents as possible suspects early in the investigation. Two sketches of an unidentified woman seen at the swap meet were released after Jacqueline disappeared. A witness told authorities that he saw the female lingering around the portable toilets while Castaneda and Jacqueline were in the vicinity. Both sketches are posted with this case summary. No one matching her description was at the swap meet when investigators arrived. Investigators are also searching for an unidentified full-size red pickup truck that was seen near the swap meet at the time Jacqueline vanished. The vehicle is possibly a Ford model, and authorities do not know if it is connected to her case. Authorities believe Jacqueline may have been taken by a woman who wanted to raise a child. Her disappearance remains unsolved. Number 5. April was last seen walking to an arcade at Woodchuck RV Campground in Rancho, California, on December 13, 1986. She and her mother lived there. She has never been heard from again. April was being supervised by a neighbor, William James Bannister, at the time she disappeared. He was employed as a truck driver from Colorado in 1986. He had offered to babysit her when she and her mother went to work at an old town Temecula thrift store in Temecula, California that day. He said he gave April $5 to play video games at the arcade, and she never returned home. The day after April's disappearance, Bannister went to his father's wedding reception in dirt-caked clothes. He told the other attendees that he had gotten dirty while participating in the search for April. In fact, he was not part of the search efforts. He spoke to his father privately, then left the reception a short time afterward. That evening, Bannister's father told his new wife that Bannister had done it again. Bannister had killed his girlfriend in San Diego, California in 1978 and served five years in prison for second-degree murder in that case. He was released from prison in 1984. After April's disappearance, in 1993, he tried to strangle his son's 14-year-old girlfriend in the back of his truck and was sentenced to 16 years for attempted murder. When police searched the truck for evidence in that case, they found jewelry, 
bloodstained women's undergarments and several ligatures. Bannister was charged with April's presumed homicide in 1995, nine years after she disappeared. He was extradited from Colorado to California for the trial. Investigators believed that he killed April as part of a brutal sexual fantasy, then concealed her remains. His father was deceased by then, but Bannister's son testified that, in 1989, Bannister had told him April was dead. Bannister allegedly stated April fell off a rock and broke her neck while they were hiking together. He was convicted of her murder in 1998 and sentenced to life in prison without parole in early 1999. Authorities believe Bannister may have also been involved in the disappearance of Lori Lucas, a Colorado woman who vanished in 1990, but he has never faced charges in that case. April's body has never been located. She was a first-grade student at Cottonwood Elementary School in December 1986. Foul play is suspected in her disappearance due to the circumstances involved. Number 6 Clinkscales was last seen at the Moose Club in Lagrange, Georgia, at 11 p.m. on January 27, 1976. He left the club, where he tended bar two nights a week, intending to go 35 miles away to Auburn University, where he was a junior. He never arrived there and has never been heard from again. Clinkscales vehicle, a white two-door 1974 Pinto runabout with the Georgia license plate number CEF 717, and the VIN number 4T11Y207954, has never been recovered. He was reported missing by his parents on February 3, a week later. It is uncharacteristic of Clinkscales to leave without warning. He was close to his parents and called him regularly or left notes telling of his whereabouts. They have not heard from him since his disappearance. His father initially believed he left of his own accord. Clinkscales had not been a good student at college. He initially enrolled at Auburn University after graduating high school, but made poor grades there and transferred to Lagrand University, where he continued to perform badly before dropping out of college altogether. He later re-enrolled at Auburn and changed his major from education to business administration, losing several credits in the process. He stated he planned to do better academically, but his first term's grades were not up to his expectations. His father theorized he left and tried to start life anew under a different identity as a result of his poor college performance. In 1987, a man in Troop County, Georgia, found Clinkscale's Exxon credit card in the Flat Shoal Creek area. Investigators searched the vicinity where the card was found, but turned up no other evidence. In 2005, a man called Clinkscale's parents and told them that in 1976, when he was seven years old, he had witnessed the disposal of Clinkscale's body. The body, the informant said, had been covered with concrete, stuffed in a barrel, and dumped in a pond on private property. Searches of the pond turned up no sign of the barrel or any remains, but the tipster's information led to the arrest of Jimmy Earl Jones and, later, Jean Polak Johnson. Jones has been charged with concealing a death, hindering the apprehension of a criminal, and two counts of making false statements. Johnson was charged with concealing a death, making false statements, and obstructing justice. Neither has been charged with Clinkscale's murder. Investigators believe the actual killer was a man named Ray Hyde. Hyde died in 2001. He had owned a salvage yard and police dug it up twice looking for Clinkscale's missing Pinto, but never found it. Investigators do not know why Clinkscale's was killed, but they believe he may have had knowledge about Hyde's criminal activities, which involved car theft. Johnson was at Hyde's home the night Clinkscale's vanished, though she later denied this. Authorities believe Jones did not participate in the murder, but did help dispose of the body. They think Hyde moved the remains from the pond to an unknown location sometime afterwards. Clinkscale's body has never been found. His father wrote a book about his disappearance and other missing persons cases, entitled Kyle's Story, Friday Never Came. Foul play is suspected in his disappearance due to the circumstances involved. Number 7 Gum moved from his home in North Berwick, Maine to Kauai, Hawaii in February 2018 to seek enlightenment. His parents stated that prior to leaving, he had begun to withdraw from his social circle and had taken a vow of silence from his parents and possibly others. After his arrival in Hawaii, Gum checked into the Kauai Beach House Hostel and stayed there for two days. He is known to have contacted two cab companies on February 22 and 23, but neither company has a record of picking him up. His last call was placed from the hostel on February 24, 2018. He has never been heard from again. Gum's family stated he frequented California from the age of 17, working odd jobs in Maine between trips west. 
He was a skateboarder and graffiti artist, and he played piano, drums and guitar, and wrote lyrics. He was in a band and had wanted to be a professional musician, but prior to his disappearance, he began to shun the idea of fame and fortune. He had taken a trip to India and had done extensive research on religion and spiritualism, as well as healing herbs and natural supplements. He adopted a strict vegan diet and began losing weight as a result, and he pulled away from his friends and spent a lot time in his room meditating, he refused to even eat meals with his parents. He did not use alcohol or drugs at the time of his disappearance. When Gum traveled to Hawaii, he had only cash on him, and he has not withdrawn any money from his bank account, which contained nearly $8,000, since he went missing. His parents think he may have sought out Buddhist or Hindu monks in Hawaii in order to become enlightened. Gum's friends traveled to Hawaii to search for him in late 2019. They found out he may have been seen camping in Hawaii and that he may have shopped for camping gear in the spring of 2019. They think he may have gone to the Kaliola Valley area to live off the grid and may not want to be found. The circumstances of his disappearance are unclear.